thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello, sir. 106 today. More terror for everyone to get lost in. We're in. We're in deep now. A <laughs> uh, couple quick announcements in okay. the show. Uh, we have a new Demon Tea shirt and mug set in the store. You can get them individually mm-hmm. uh, at badmagicmerch.com. Looks so cool. Reminds me of Japanese uh, Oni artwork, I think is how you say it. What's that? It's like these masks, sculptures, paintings. Oh, uh, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. With like little horns coming mm-hmm. out of the mouth. It's um, also a lot of traditional like Japanese like tattoo kind of art. Oh, That yeah. style. Uh, is that like the, the, or maybe that's Thai where they like tap it into you? That I believe is or- Samoan. Oh, it's uh, Samoan? Or like Pacific Islander, oh, that style. This mm-hmm. is so t- random? T- Tahitian and stuff. <laughs> Randomly, I saw a Guy Fieri was getting a tattoo like huh? that. I don't, I don't know why I know that. Maybe he's maybe he's Pacific Islander. I don't, I don't know. know. No. I think he was on a trip with his kid. Okay. Uh, traditional. <laughs> yeah, it's a very distinctive kind of look, and I, I love it. Cool. And, and if you're like, wait, what is that? You'll recognize it when you see it. You're yeah. like, oh, yeah, that style. Yeah, I looked at it before the show, so I know what you're talking about. But then when you called it out, I'm like, oh, yeah, I have last week's set. I have mm-hmm. the mug from mm-hmm. this is my favorite thing because I love everything gold. Yes. And look at how dope the coasters are. That more <gasps> medieval stained glass look. They're so fun. Mm-hmm. Proud to remind everyone that the uh, Bad Magic Productions Charity of the Month is the American Nurses Foundation Coronavirus Response Fund for Nurses, and we'll be donating 15400 of our Patreon subscriptions, so thank you, Roberts and Annabelle. Way to go, guys. Mm-hmm. Nurses have uh, bore the brunt of the work the past 18 months, you know, with yeah. the pandemic, and the Response Fund re- provides mental health support, direct financial aid, education, and evidence-based information and overall advocacy for nurses. So if you want to find uh, this charity, just go to the link in our episode description, or you can just do a Google search, Coronas, yeah. Coronavirus Response Fund for Nurses. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Easy and peasy. Th- and then you had some uh, a, a book announcement to mention. Yes, yes, yes. And everything is fine. I just mm-hmm. realized that last year, because it was the first year doing it, yeah. every week it was update, update, update. And I took it for granted mm-hmm. that we have new listeners. Yes. And they don't know actually what the process is. Right. So we've gotten a handful of emails of like, hey, I ordered the book. Where is it? And I'm like, oh, it was a pre-order. So mm-hmm. I just decided... We should just talk about it very quickly. Yeah. So where we're at in the process is last week we got like the hard outside cover. Yeah. Beautiful. We have the boxes. The boxes will be for so the cool. oh yeah, and they're for the autographed ones, and they're so special. They're mm-hmm. so pretty. Logan did such an amazing job. Um, and the books are in print right now. So they're at this phase where it's called um, folded and gathered, where they're making, you know, when you open like a hardbound book and you can kind of see the little sections. Mm -hmm. If you look at the top where it's glued, they're making that right now. I'm waiting on that to come to us for just one last pass of like, yep, looks perfect. And then, I mean, they're already printing them, so I don't, I can't really change anything, (laughs) but uh, it's all formality. And then, yeah, we should have the books. It still looks like it'll be on schedule to have the books. In our hands, end of September, beginning of October, we'll sign them, we'll ship them out, get the pre-orders out. Everyone should have their pre-orders by Halloween, it looks like. Mm-hmm. That is still holding true. And Great. then and then that's that. And that's that. And then that's that. There'll be We're going to have uh, uh, some extras on sale after the pre-orders go out. We just don't know. The way that printing works is there's like an over-under, so we just kind of are being vague with that on purpose because we don't know what's going to happen. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. How many stories do you have today? I have three. Three stories instead I have three. of two. Yeah, because none of them were particularly big. Yeah. But I felt like, you know, it's kind of nice sometimes to have three smaller ones. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have I have some smaller ones, too. I, I have two stories, kind of. Uh, the first is a collection of several stories. Okay. So a bunch of smaller stories from Montana. Ooh. Uh, yeah, most of them set in Great Falls, which isn't really that far from Coeur d'Alene, where we are, uh, especially as far as driving in the West goes. Mm-hmm. It's funny when you talk to people on the East Coast, like five hours. My God, that would get you like through two states. Right. Like here, it's like, that's not not a bad drive. No, not at all. Uh, (laughs) Very interesting sightings, most of which involve law enforcement officers going on record with what they thought they saw. Oh, that's cool. We haven't seen anything like that in a while. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to head to rural Nebraska between Donovan and Grand Island to look into some lore that surrounds the Witch's Bridge. 
and I'll share an encounter tale from the 1960s regarding this bridge. Is there an island in Nebraska? Uh, you know what? I actually don't know how the town – it's about a 50,000-person town if I remember correctly. Uh, and I want to say – oh, my gosh. I, I'm not, I'd be guessing if I said what part of Nebraska. I think it's like south-central okay. Nebraska. I don't know if there – maybe there's an island along the river that goes oh, no, through town like, or something. How is no, that? it's definitely not on the coast. <laughs> okay, uh, I thought my geography was the most, way off. It's the most not on the coast. It's <laughs> kind of right in the center. Most no coast. <laughs> uh, are you ready for our first story? I am. Can I get settled in? Get settled in. A uh, little at, bit of setup. Look at these cute voodoo doll socks. Oh, those are cool. They kind of look like your um, – like Layla Trela. Mm-hmm. And gotta, you have a special gotta, Layla Trela like this de- week. Like a demon Layla, a little I red know. devil Layla today. Give it a sniff. I can't smell anything. Oh, do you have COVID? No. I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> I could smell it. Huh. huh. Well, maybe. Huh? Maybe. <laughs> maybe a little cinnamon, hot cinnamon? I don't know. I can't really tell. Hmm. Uh, all right. So let's get into this first story. In Great Falls, Montana, just over a five-hour drive, as I said, from right here in Coeur d'Alene, some police officers are among those who believe that uh, one of their jail cells is haunted. Some uh, sheriff's officers, I guess, technically. Uh, The old Cascade County Jail was built in the early 1900s, directly across the street from the west face of the courthouse. And Bob Edwards, Cascade County Sheriff from 2010 to 2018, and a deputy and detention officer for another 18 years before that, claims he saw a strange mist floating through the old cells on a video monitor. It spooked him, and to this day, he has no explanation for it. His experience will lead us into some other unsettling Montana ghost stories, many of which involve... Again, law enforcement officers. Time now for the tale of Montana's Most Haunted. One day, Bob was doing a lap around the perimeter of the old jail. Like many pre-modern jails, the building was built with cells on one side of the building and an apartment for the sheriff on the other. Many years ago, in the early 20th century, the sheriff was often required to live on the premises. Sounds absolutely terrible. (laughs) Bob was upstairs in the apartment one night when he heard footsteps coming up from the rickety stairs. Initially, Bob figured someone, maybe his deputy downstairs, was trying to play a trick on him, and he opened the door quickly. And then to his shock, there was no one there. He went downstairs and asked his deputy, Mike, if anyone had just gone upstairs, and Mike looked back at him, clearly confused. You're the only person up there, Bob, he replied. Nobody else is here. Bob then told Mike there was no way he was going back up there that night to check things out. He was admittedly spooked. They both had a good laugh about it, and then Mike and Bob settled in for the rest of their shift on the ground floor watching the video monitor. And after a few moments, Bob pointed to the video monitor trained on the hospital cell, the cell where sick or injured inmates were treated and held. Mike, he said excitedly, Mike! Mike looked up and his eyes took the scene in. They grew wider until only a thin strip of iris was visible around his large pupils. The mist, he whispered. Where's it coming from? As they watched, the mist seemed to blow and swirl around the room. It looked like cigarette smoke, but far too much for one person to produce. And who would be in the jail smoking a cigarette? Mike said he was going down to investigate. Once he was standing in the cell, he looked around and shouted up towards the camera that he didn't see any mist. But Bob still saw the mist on the monitor, and as he watched horrified, the mist began to surround Mike, like it wanted to cover him entirely. Mike raised his hand to see if he could feel it, and then the mist quickly shot off the screen. The window, Mike called. From downstairs, his voice sounded far off and ghostly, like something in the mist had taken a piece of him with it. Bob prayed that it was just the echo. Bob, the window, he yelled. That was when Bob saw that the windows, which he had never messed with, which he had just verified were closed when he had done his perimeter check, were now wide open. Bob was terrified, goosebumps raised on his arms. He also felt ridiculous. He'd been a corrections officer in charge of 300 burly guys before, and now he was afraid of some mist? He was too embarrassed to talk about what he saw that night for a long time. He thought maybe he and Mike had just worked themselves up and assumed a paranormal explanation for something that was probably totally explainable. Probably. But a few years later, he would experience another incident that would turn him into a true paranormal believer. After everyone had almost managed to forget about the mist, the Sheriff's Explorers Post, a program for young people interested in a career in law enforcement, decided to put on a haunted house at the old jail and raise some money for their program. Bob said he'd help out, though privately, he didn't really want to get involved. He hated that it still bothered him, but he was still spooked about that mist and didn't love the idea of trying to make their jail look any scarier than it did already. After dark the night before, it was, uh, it was to open, he let one of the most seasoned detectives go downstairs and put the finishing touches on some decorations. The detective headed down, and then a few minutes later, BANG! A big metal door slammed shut, echoing throughout the jail. Bob thought there might be a transient downstairs and unholstered his gun, but when he got down there, he just found the detective. 
a person who had been on the scene of gruesome murder cases and never batted an eye, and now he was trembling badly. Bob, the detective said, I went down those stairs, shut off the lights, and I will never go down there alone again. And he refused to say anything else about what he'd seen. He was as white as a ghost. And then behind the man, Bob saw the mist again. Not wanting to scare the detective, he didn't want to say anything, but he knew now without a doubt that what he'd seen before was all too real and definitely paranormal. And Bob Edwards isn't alone when it comes to tales about the old jail or other spooky places around Great Falls. Michelle Herbley of the Great Falls-based Montana Association of Paranormal Studies says her group usually gets calls regarding houses in the area. Herbley said that other than the old jail, the lobby bar has had quite a few paranormal sightings over the years. And when she investigated them, she claims to have made contact with a spirit who asked to be called Duncan, a spirit whose energy she really didn't like. It was only later, researching the town's history, that she realized she had most likely talked to the spirit of Duncan McKenzie, a man who murdered a school teacher named Lana Harding in the area on January 21st, 1974. Lana was a school teacher in a small one-classroom schoolhouse, schoolhouse and members of the community raised concerns of her well-being when she didn't arrive at the school and her shoes were left in the driveway. Duncan had raped and killed her. Mackenzie was also suspected to have brutally murdered Deborah Preddy, a teenager from Coeur d'Alene, uh. who was found dead in 1973. Mackenzie was executed via lethal injection on May 10, 1995 for Harding's murder, but he never would admit to killing Harding or Preddy. And after Michelle Herberly supposedly came into contact with his spirit, she was so spooked and disturbed by who he might have been that she never went inside the lobby bar again. But other people who work at the lobby bar, or who have gone there just as customers, claim to have had run-ins with this same spirit. They've continued to report strange occurrences there. Once a young woman who worked there saw an extension cord move around on its own. When she put her foot on it, the extension cord would be motionless. But as soon as she took it away, it would start to snake across the room again. She worried before running out of the bar that if she stayed any longer, it might snake its way up and then around her neck. Duncan had choked that poor school teacher to death. Many of those who'd worked at the lobby bar had made sure to keep the basement door firmly locked, believing that some kind of negative energy comes from down the stairs. But simply locking a door is not enough to keep Duncan downstairs. Tara Fats, former and possible current manager of the lobby bar, says that despite the shut door, some things still creep up and out. She once had to deal with a hostess, a woman named Jennifer, abruptly quitting mid-shift because she kept complaining of invisible arms wrapping around her, squeezing her. If she resisted the squeezing, she claimed invisible hands would begin to strike her in the face and head. What? Duncan seems to be in death who he was in life. Finally, across Montana, another former law enforcement officer claims to have had some pretty intense paranormal experiences back when he was still on duty. In Montana's Muscle Shell County, John Goffina, who spent 16 years with the Muscle Shell County Sheriff's Office, Sheriff's Office, once told reporters that he'd witnessed several bizarre and unexplained events on his shifts. John was once checking a grade school one night, and he heard what sounded like tiny footsteps upstairs and a child's laughter. Mm. When he walked into the room where he heard the laughter coming from, the laughter abruptly stopped, and then he froze in his tracks. In the thick dust of the abandoned classroom, he found himself staring at a row of tiny, fresh footprints leading straight to an open window. Then, outside, where the little person would have had to have gone out in the fresh snow, there were no footprints. It was as if the laughter just vanished. Uh, the little laughter just vanished, excuse me, which is exactly what John thinks happened. Another night, he went to high school after a report came in about suspected vandalism there. When he entered the gym, he distinctly heard some footsteps again coming from somewhere on the other side of the gym, like someone was running across the gym. Thinking it was the vandal, he ran towards the sound. As he sprinted across the gym, the motion detector lights came on. No one was in the gym with him, and he immediately began to wonder why he'd set off the motion detection lights when the other person hadn't. Maybe he thought whoever he heard running wasn't a person at all, not a living person anyway. John's most direct and intense paranormal experience occurred when he was no longer a deputy. He once went to the hospital in Roundup, the county seat, when he had a bad allergic reaction. He was lying on a bed when a nurse wearing a uniform that looked like it came from the 50s or 60s entered the room. Tired from a long day out and in a bit of pain, John initially didn't think a lot of it. The woman came in, talked to him a little bit, took his vitals and left. But then a few minutes later, another nurse came in to take his vitals again. I've already been seen, he told the second nurse, who looked at him skeptically. 
She explained that they had been swamped all day, that there was no one on duty who would have been just wandering around looking for something else to do. John then described the first nurse, gave the woman's name. The second nurse told him there was no one by that name that worked there, that she hadn't heard of a nurse by that name ever working there, didn't know anyone who matched the physical description he gave her. John now had no doubt he had been seen by a ghost. John Goffin and Bob Edwards are both now retired from law enforcement. I imagine both still get the chills looking back on these experiences, thinking about some things that go bump in the night and how they aren't always trespassers or criminals. Sometimes they're things that can't be arrested. Yeek. Yeah, some uh, spooky ones. The little footsteps ones got me the most. Could you hear something in your headphones when you were telling that story? No, I saw you got weirded out a few times. I know. I Like, my heart is racing hmm. right now. It, like, I, I was hearing, like, a little... I don't, I don't know how to explain the sound. It sounded sort of like someone talking, hmm. but it also sounded like a zipper. Weird. Yeah, not comfortable at all. But, like, not... I mean, I know what the sounds like that sound like coming from, like, the studio, or, or from outside of the recording studio, mm-hmm. like, on the other side of this wall. There's nothing there. I know what it sounds like when a car goes by. It wasn't anything like that. Then I thought, I'm like, is it my breathing? You know how sometimes like you're, um, it kind of catches and you sound mm-hmm. a little wheezy? Yeah. But I don't, I don't think that's it. I don't feel, which, <laughs> I, I didn't want to breathe hard into the mic, which, which is what I'd really like to do is just yeah. give like a big like, <sighs> <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. But I don't mm. think that's it. I'm very uncomfortable. I'm very, I'm on high alert today. I know. We'll talk about that at the end. I know. We'll talk about yeah. that in between. In between, yes. Uh, my stories st- and yours. Yeah. 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 Like some some stuff. Weekend scares to talk mm-hmm, about. Mm-hmm. Uh, this first picture, Old Cascade County Jail. Just a little picture from the outside. Cool okay. old building. Yeah. Uh, the next picture, this is a picture of former Sheriff Bob Edwards, the man I mentioned, on the stairs, talking about where he saw those footsteps. Or, or, you know, where he heard, excuse me, those footsteps coming up behind him. And that's the jail? Uh-huh, the old jail. There's a new one now. I was like, wow, that's an interesting setup for a jail. Yeah, the, this is the one that had the apartment in it. It was like a yeah, you know, combo yeah. kind of building. They have a new one, uh, much more modern facility now. Former, uh, and then this is uh, that Bob, Bob Edwards again, excuse me, describing that mist he saw. This that's is, creepy. Mm-hmm. And it was so crazy that one could see it, in, like the person on the camera, watching on the camera could yeah. see it, but the person in the mist could Couldn't. not see it. Mm-hmm. That is so uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It makes you feel like you're losing your mind on both sides. Right. Absolutely. I could not find a photo of John Goffina over in Muscle Shell County. I did find an artist's rendition of what that 50s ghost nurse may have looked like. She's hot. Mm-hmm. So that's, that could I have like been it. her. I like could it. have been who checked on him. Or this, then there's one more photo of this is, again, just an artist's rendition of what yeah. she might have looked like. We don't know. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> She's like a Vargas girl. Nice. Oh, yeah. I forgot that that was the name for that style. Oh, yeah. I always think of just like pinup, but Vargas was... That's a person's name, right? I be- who, yeah, I an illustrator a, who was yeah. famous for drawing images like that. I am 99.9% sure. I think sure you're right. You are I correct. forgot about that. I remember like, seeing those books. Um, okay. okay. Uh, I like that little collection of stories. I thought there was some, sometimes like with the smaller ones when it's just like quick hits. I know. That's how my not, stories they're, are. They're not as spooky to me sometimes because I'm not oh. as invested in like this, you know, big like arc. But those ones did sk- uh, spook me, especially like the dust footprints. Ah. Yeah, the little I can just ones, picture it so distinctly. The little ones actually sometimes scare me more because it's like right to the point. Mm. And there's, it, ah, it feels like true. you're not fucking around. Like you okay. are just like, I was scared. Yep. This thing happened. Um, yeah. Did I tell a story about a haunted jail? Because if not, oh, then I man. read one from a fan recently that I was like, I think I flagged it for a future episode. Huh. It was really interesting. I I want to say we have. No, I I know that I have before. But I don't think I've I don't know told we, mine. I don't know if we've had a fan story from a haunted jail. Okay. Yeah, it was yeah really... I think we've had a few before from uh, yeah. around places. Yeah. It's hard to remember. Mm-hmm. That well, back... one one not that long ago was in New Mexico. I do remember that. That with the scorpions. Remember being dropped mm-hmm. from above? No, on my side. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking of what those in general. And then there was one Pennsylvania, I think. But yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then that video, like the security camera stuff reminded me of that episode we did not that long ago. I think it, it was your story. And there was like a, a thing crawling down the hall, like the person watching the security footage could see it and then it like couldn't see it. Oh, yes. In Japan. Uh, I want to say Hong Kong, I think. I can't remember. Yeah. I know it was not or in Japan. the States. Yeah. Might but, have been Japan. Yeah. Oh, buddy. Mm-hmm. Not, uh, not great. That was the... Um, oh, God. It just freaks me out. Hello Kitty Is murder. that the Hello Kitty murder? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, it is. That's a very graphic episode. Yes, yes. Yes, but man, was that a story. Uh, are you ready to move on from Montana and southeast to Nebraska? Yeah, take me to Nebraska. We're going to head from the New West to the Old West. Uh, ready for some witch folklore? Oh, yeah. I'm uh, a little witchy. You're a little witchy. 
Uh, quite a bit of spooky setup with this one. Uh, just north of the tiny town of Donovan, Nebraska, between Donovan and Grand Island, you know, because it's a very coastal state, <laughs> uh, is a bridge that has been the source of many horror tales, both old and new. Which is bridge? It's named after a woman who once lived, supposedly, in an old house at the end of the bridge. According to local legend, she was believed to have dabbled in witchcraft, or at least that's what she was accused of. And one night, some scared local townspeople decided to form a vigilante lynch mob. Oh, no. Take what they considered to be justice into their own hands. They decided to kill who they believed to be a heretic. And when they made it to her house that night, they grabbed the poor woman, dragged her out of her home, hanged her from a tree directly in front of her home. Jesus. And again, according to the legend, in her last moment, she cursed the house and the surrounding land. Once dead, her body was then unceremoniously dumped into the creek below the bridge. Oh. The bridge next to her home was soon renamed, not officially, of course, but locally, Witch's Bridge. Her house still stood, but was now vacant, and horrible things followed. Over 100 years ago, there was a terrible freak accident on the bridge. Railroad workers were trying to free up an ice jam they had built up against their own nearby rail bridge, and some residents stood on Witch's Bridge to watch some dynamite explosions. One of the blasts made the Witch's Bridge shake violently, and a young mother holding her baby stumbled. Oh my god, no. Dropped her baby. No. The doomed child fell into the freezing creek below the bridge and was never seen again. Oh god. Some claim to have seen the witch's face staring back up from beneath the water where the baby fell. The poor mother's rumored to have spent the rest of her days wandering the creek, <laughs> looking for the body before falling asleep one night, heartbroken and never waking up again. There have been numerous fatal car accidents on the bridge over the years, and in 2007, it was the scene of a brutal murder. Many believe these incidents have added to the bridge being haunted. They think that now those who drive past at the wrong time of night or try to stop on the bridge may have an encounter they will not soon forget. Some say that if you leave your car on the bridge and get out, an invisible hand may grab you and pull you towards the side of the bridge, try and toss you over the side, pull you down towards the water below. The witch's former house still sits at the end of the bridge. People have reported seeing the rocking chair on the front porch slowly rock back and forth, even when there's no breeze in the air. An online forum commentator, uh, who, commenter who got out their car to investigate saw the rocking chair and felt a cold, cold breeze float past. And then when they got back into their car and tried to speed away, they felt a thump like they'd hit something. They got out, found a dead dog on the bridge <gasps> that had seemingly come from nowhere. When they look back as they drove away, the definitely formerly dead dog was somehow now alive and staring back at them with glowing red eyes. The most horrifying encounter story seemed to have happened on full moon nights. People claim that if you walk to the center of the bridge during the full moon and peer down into Weeping Water Creek, you might see a reflection of either your own corpse or the witch's face staring back at you. Recently, another online story has surfaced, not a first-hand encounter tale, but one passed down from a grandmother to her granddaughter. A user named Katie wrote a blog post about the witch's bridge sharing her grandmother's story. A senior year challenge went horribly wrong many years ago when a group of teens decided to tempt some of the legends that swirled around the witch during a full moon. Time now for the tale of the witch's bridge. November 1964. It was my last year at Grand Island Senior High School. I was 18 and dating a boy named Michael. I was a goody two-shoes and Michael was a daredevil who hung out with the local troublemakers. My parents hated him. <laughs> For the past 10 years, there have been a challenge for Grand Island High seniors to cross Witch's Bridge with nothing but the light of the moon to guide them. Oh. If you didn't complete the challenge, you'd be mocked during graduation ceremony. Some even believed that if you didn't do it, the witch would curse you and you wouldn't graduate. I had no idea who started this challenge, but I knew almost every senior at school had done it. Michael kept mentioning the challenge every few days, testing the waters to see when I'd be ready to go with him. I didn't want to. I'd always been scared of ghost stories and I was scared of the dark. I figured if I ignored him, he'd forget about it and just go to the challenge with his own friends. I was willing to take the risk of being teased in some way on graduation day and of not graduating. It all seemed so ridiculous. If I got embarrassed on my last day of school, oh well, I was determined to go to college and move on from the area anyways. Mike picked me up on a Friday night for the date. For a date. We went to the dinner, or went to the diner and chatted about school. Diner always throws me off. I always want to say dinner when I first see it. It's okay. We forgive you. I <laughs> uh, went to the diner and chatted about school, graduation, and Michael's dream of getting hired as a mechanic at the local auto shop. Cute. We stayed until it was fully dark outside. Want to get out of here? Mike asked, flashing me a grin. I'm not ready to go home yet. We won't. Come on, let's go. He slapped a $5 bill down on the table, grabbed my hand, pulled me out of the booth and into his old truck. I expected him to take us to the theater where we could buy cheap tickets and spend more time making out than watching the show. But when he drove past the theater and towards the other side of town, I got nervous. Where are we going? 
You'll see. Just relax, he said. A few minutes later, he stopped in front of a small rundown house. It was dark except for a light shining in an outdoor shed. Beep, beep. Michael honked his horn. And then a tall, slim figure of a man jogged towards the truck. Hey, Mike, he said as he jumped into the back seat. Hey, Amy. It was Rob Harrison, a 21-year-old mechanic at the auto shop. Rob was Michael's hero. He bought him cigarettes, pot, alcohol, always knew where the party was. He was trouble and had already been arrested twice for drunken fighting. Can I talk to you? I asked Michael. He sighed. Give us a second, will you, Rob? We climbed out of his truck. I walked a few yards away, tapping my foot as I waited for him to face me. What's going on, babe? Seriously? We're supposed to be on a date and you're picking up Rob? Amy. He threw his arm around me, leading me back to the truck. I promise it'll make sense soon. We're going to have such a good time tonight, I swear. Are we going to a party? Um, you could say that. I stopped digging my heels into the ground. Tell me where we're going. Come on, don't be like that. Let's just say we're going on an adventure. We have one more stop before we get there. I stood silently as Michael drove to the, uh, down the road into his neighborhood. To my surprise, his little brother Chris, a sophomore, jogged out of the house and hopped into the truck. Hey, Amy, he grinned at me. Hey, Chris, what are you doing here? Mike's taking his... Shut up, Michael hissed. Oh, right, sorry, he said with a sheepish grin. The boys chatted while I stared out the window, watching the full moon float along with the truck. We'd been driving for about 15 minutes with no end in sight. We were now in a tiny rural area, more village than actual town. I spotted a road sign. Donovan was up ahead a few miles. Now at least I kind of knew where we were. I almost never came out this way. I assume we must be going to a party out in the middle of nowhere, but Michael drove past a small farm, the only house in sight. His headlights soon illuminated a bridge off in the distance. A few minutes later, he slowed down to a crawl, coming to a stop right at the edge of the bridge. We're here, I realized, dread sinking into my stomach. Michael had brought me here for the challenge. I scowled. What the hell, Michael? I already told you I don't care about this stupid challenge. I'll stay in the truck. You idiots just get it over with. That's why I brought Rob and Chris, he said. I knew you'd chicken out if it was just me and you. But with the three of us here, you shouldn't be scared at all. We'll keep on lookout for anything weird. We can all cross together. No. Come on. You have to do it, Amy. Everyone's going to make fun of you for being a big chicken. You don't want to get cursed, do you? Chris put a hand on my shoulder. It'll be fun, Ames. Like Mike said, we're all here to help you. Nothing bad's going to happen. Yeah, Rob interjected. No need to be so scared. I'm not scared, I huffed. I just think this is pointless. It's not even real anyway. Well, if it's not real, why don't you cross? I mean, if you're not scared, it shouldn't matter. Yeah, babe, Michael said. If you're not scared like you say, then just come on with us. But I guess if you really are scared, you can stay in the truck until we get back. But it might be a while. And it might be scary in the truck, being alone and all. He smiled a little devilish grin. Dang it, of course it would be scarier, sitting in the truck out alone here in the dark. I was scared shitless. Whatever. Let's just get it over with, I said. I got out of the truck and stood on the edge of the bridge, feet brushing the concrete. I looked ahead as far as I could see. The moon shined down on the open bridge, illuminating the rushing creek below. I could see the house at the end, sitting there, waiting for us. Michael grabbed my hand, giving me a wink as he pulled me forward. I could hear the creek below warning us of the height and potential danger of being on the bridge at night when a car might not see us until it was too late. Before I knew it, we were halfway across. See, everything's fine, Mike whispered. I relaxed my shoulders, letting the tension leave my body. Everything was fine, wasn't it? It was a peaceful night. No clouds in the sky, no strong winds. Even the creek was calmer than normal. We were getting closer to the old house. I could now see details of the front porch, that lone rocking chair sitting right in the middle. I felt brave enough to let go of my death grip on Michael's hand. But then, just as I let go and took my first step toward forward on my own, a cold, strong breeze whipped past me, almost like the wind you feel when a car drives past you on the sidewalk. The rocking chair on the porch started to slowly rock back and forth, the sound of creaking wood breaking the silence. Michael, I whispered, grabbing his hand again. Do you see that? What? We captured the attention of Rob and Chris now. We turned back to see what we, why we had stopped. All eyes were on me. I saw the rocking chair moving. It just creeped me out a little bit. It's probably just the wind. I shrugged my shoulders and tried to appear nonchalant about it all. There's no wind, Aim. None of us felt it, at least, Chris said, looking confused. Sorry, guys. Just Let's just keep going. Was I the only one who could see the rocking chair who felt that strong breeze? Were they messing with me? I looked back at the porch. The chair was still rocking back and forth, slightly faster now unnervingly faster. It gave me the chills and I had to fight to suppress a shudder. The four of us finally stopped at the end of the bridge facing the old house. The chair wasn't moving anymore. Well, kids, Rob said, I'm the witness and Chris here isn't old enough to go with you up on the porch yet, so it looks like it's time for you two to finish your challenge and make sure you graduate with honor. 
All right, Mike said with a grin, throwing his arm around me. What do we do now? Normally, you're supposed to go one at a time. But since Amy's a little scared, we'll make an exception. First, walk up on the porch. And then one at a time, sit down on the rocking chair. Stay there for at least 10 seconds. When you're both done, walk across the bridge together. Stop in the center. Go past the rail. Stand on the edge. Look down into the water for 10 more seconds. Then just walk back onto the car. And that's it. The challenge will be complete. I can do this, I told myself. Just 20 seconds. Then you never have to think about any of this nonsense ever again. I thought about the cold breeze only I felt. The chair rocking on its own. This time the shutter was too big for me to fight. You sure you can do this? Asked Michael. I'll be fine, I said, and hoped that was true. Ready to begin, Rob asked. Let's go, I told Michael. Together we walked up the short wooden steps, our feet making the old wood creak. I stood in front of the rocking chair. It was almost impossible to describe, but up close I could feel something evil coming from the inside of the house. Something wrong, dangerous, warning us to leave. But for the sake of not looking like a chicken, I stayed. I wanted to get it over with. I'll go first, I said with a voice I had to actively work to keep from shaking. But then Mike plopped down in the rocking chair, gave himself a few pushes forward and back, and sat there for his full ten seconds. See, babe, go ahead, it's fine. Swallowing, I slowly turned around and now sat in the chair. One, two, three, four, five, six. A strong, freezing wind rushed towards my face with strength enough to send me back toppling over and out of the chair. I gasped as my, gasped as my head hit the porch. Amy! Mike shouted, bending down to help me. Are you okay? What the hell just happened? I, I don't know. I, I think I just lost my balance, I said. I wondered the same as Mike. I felt like I was going crazy, but I swore that the cold breeze pushed me hard enough to send me flying backward with enough force to fall out of the rocking chair. It felt like a message. Something wanted us out of there. Let's just finish this stupid challenge, I said over my shoulder as we marched towards the center of the bridge now. It was almost like my fears were forgotten overshadowed by my anger for the moment. I wanted this to be over with so I could go home. I was angry with Mike, Rob, and Chris, with every kid in my high school for making this dangerous little game a stupid tradition. Mike's footsteps followed me towards the center of the bridge. Ready? I could hear the nerves in his voice. He was almost as scared as I was. I only nodded and then carefully stepped up onto the wooden railing, lifting my leg, setting it down on the other side. The ledge was only a few inches wide. The edges of my feet now hung over the water rushing below us. There was an embankment down the side, but at the center there was nothing but open air between us and the creek. The moonlight cast a white glow on the water. I took a deep breath and looked down. I could see my reflection in the water, the image broken by the current, but I could still tell it was me. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. I stopped, jerking back, gripping the railings as hard as I could. My reflection had changed. It was still me, but now, oh my god, now I had a rope around my neck. I lifted one of my hands, feeling my neck for a rope I knew wasn't there. The current of the creek disrupted my image again, and when the reflection returned, I looked even more different. My face was now almost purple, eyes rolled up into the back of my head, neck straining. I looked like I was dying, choking from the rope around my neck. No, I whispered, grabbing my neck. No, 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 no. Taking my hands off the bridge nearly made me lose my balance and go toppling down into the water. I looked over at Mike. He stared down at himself with the same horrified expression. I knew right away he could see it too. As I opened my mouth to say something, he screamed. His feet fell out from under him. I screamed too as his head hit the edge of the bridge. I watched him seemingly get pulled straight down into the river. Mike, I screamed. Rob and Chris echoed me with their own shouting. They scrambled as fast as they could down the embankment, racing into the water to catch him before the current pulled him away. I climbed back over and scurried down, running into the freezing water. Rob and Chris splashed around, searching for him. There! Mike was caught in a tangle of branches by the shore. I ran to him as fast as I could, pulling his face out of the water. Mike! I shook him. He now moaned in pain, but he wouldn't open his eyes. I found him! I found him! Over here! Help me carry him! Amy! Chris shouted. Get his keys from his pocket! I felt around Mike's legs, panicking. What if the keys were lost in the creek? How would we get help? I felt a metallic lump in his front pocket and grabbed the keys, holding them under the moonlight. Amy, go back up and start the truck. Meet us at the edge of the embankment. Me and Chris will carry him. Let's go! Rob shouted at us. I ran up the hill, tripping over branches and debris, but I made it to the truck. I hopped in, jammed the keys into the ignition, and turned, but the truck wouldn't start. I tried again, and again, nothing. Damn it! I shouted, banging on the steering wheel. When I looked up now, I could see a shadowy outline of a person, a woman, standing at the edge of the bridge, drifting in and out of the light. I felt evil coming off her in waves, and realization struck me. It was her, the witch. She was the one who tried to push me, the one who tried to hurt Mike, who did hurt Mike. 
I was terrified, but my anger made me brave. I'm not scared of you, I lied, as I put much, as much venom as I could into my voice. Let us go, now! Somehow it worked. Or at least I thought it did at the time. Continuing to stare at me, she smiled a knowing smile before slowly fading away into the darkness. I turned the key again, and the truck roared to life. I met Rob and Chris and climbed into the back with Mike. His head was bleeding badly, but he was still conscious. His blood soaked through his jeans, uh, through my jeans, dripping onto the seat below me. What happened? Chris asked as he sped off. The nearest hospital was 20 minutes away. I pressed Mike's head when as hard as I dared trying to stop the bleeding. I waited to call my racing heart before I answered. S something, something pulled him off the bridge. We were looking into the water and I saw, God, I don't even know what I saw, but it, it was me. I was dead. I, I looked over and I know Mike saw it too. Next thing I knew, he was getting dragged into the water. I know it sounds crazy, but it happened. We never should have come here. This is so dangerous. And now Mike is going to die and no one will ever believe me. I believe you, Amy, Rob said, turning around to look me in the eyes. I believe you. We drove the next few minutes in silence. I stroked Mike's hair, praying silently for him to be okay. Listen, Rob told us when we were almost at the hospital. The doctors are going to ask what happened to him. They're probably going to ask security officers to talk to us to see if they need to call the police. We are not going to tell them why we were really out there. Understood? We can't lie to the police, Rob, Chris said, throwing him a disbelieving look. We have to, or else they're going to pull us all, put us all in jail for endangerment, possibly manslaughter if Mike isn't okay. We're going to tell them we were out there for a drive and we got lost. Mike started wandering around the bridge. He fell down from the embankment, not from the center. Do you got it? We got it. And we reached the hospital a few minutes later. Rob and Chris carried Mike inside while I parked his truck before also walking in. Once inside the doors, I looked down at my pants. They were covered in Mike's blood. Oh my goodness, honey, are you hurt? A nurse asked me when I ran inside the waiting room, His, uh, her eyes wide in shock. N no, it's, it's my boyfriend's blood. Is he okay? Where can I go to wait for him? Well, she hesitated. There's a man over there who'd like to ask you kids, kids some questions. Go on and meet your friends. I walked over to the nearly empty waiting room where Chris and Rob were standing in front of a security guard. The guard greeted me with a stern look. I'm going to ask you, I'm gonna need to ask you kids some questions just to find out what happened to your friend Mike. He's hurt real bad. Taking a deep breath and putting as much confidence as I could into my voice, I responded, of course, officer. We'll answer any questions you have. But then I saw her again. She was now standing right behind the security guard. She approached him with what looked like noose. When she raised it to put it over his head, I screamed, She's behind you! The security guard jumped and spun around. She was, of course, gone, and he was upset. And so was I. I started crying. I broke down. I told him what I thought really happened. And not surprisingly, he did not believe me. We didn't end up getting charged with anything that night, but our parents were called in. It was a whole big mess. Mike nearly died that night. His parents were furious. Everyone suspected we were covering something sinister up. Even, work, even worse, Mike became suspicious of me. Because of his head injury, he had no memory of everything that happened that night. He just heard the two of us were looking, standing next to each other, down into the water, no one else around, and then something pushed him off. And Chris and Rob, they never actually saw anything paranormal that night. And while Rob told me that night that he did believe me, I don't think he still did after a little while. Not when everyone else seemed to suspect I was hiding something, that maybe I had pushed Mike. Why would I do that? I did leave the area after I graduated. I couldn't leave fast enough. And I haven't come back many times since. Not long after I left town, my folks moved to Lincoln, where I was, and have been ever since. There was no reason to come back. I've never been quite the same since that night. I got married, I've had a family, lived a pretty good life. But I've always felt a little bit afraid, because sometimes I still see her. I'll see her face in the mirror. I'll see her shadowy form in the corner of a room. Sometimes I'll see her behind whoever I'm talking to. Worst of all is when I see her in the water. Only a few times since then I've gone near water in the moonlight, and every time I have, when I've looked down into the water, it's her face, not mine, I see staring back at me. If it wasn't for her, I don't think I'd be afraid of dying someday. But I am. I know, I can feel it in my bones, that someday when I pass, she'll be waiting for me on the other side. My God. Spooky. That was so scary and what a dumb 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 senior tradition mm -hmm. so dumb so dumb so dumb so dumb <laughs> i was so angry about that and i was so mad at mike for making her go when she didn't want to go i hate it's like, oh, a like teenage, peer pressure it's a teenage boy thing specifically mm. and i've only ever mm -hmm. well i've only ever experienced that kind of peer pressure in my teenage years from boys oh, yeah. you're such a fucking baby it's like fuck you <laughs> i'm fucking logical you yeah. dumb shit <laughs> and that is exactly how it feels mm -hmm. and you can try and be logical oh okay 
you're smarter than me. It's like, yeah, right. actually, I am. You because teenage boys, I think more than girls, feel invincible. Yes, and they're more I daredevil, did. and they mm-hmm. have more adrenaline and all that. And meanwhile, we're like, okay, I'll just clean up the mess. Here we go again. <laughs> And it kind of carries over. <laughs> uh, I just have a few photos here. Uh, first is, they're not the best quality, but it's just what was available. This is sure. a Witch's Bridge okay. photo. That's exactly what I was picturing. Okay. And then this next one is the old railroad ties from that railway bridge near the Witch's Bridge with that incident with the woman and the baby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where they were dynamiting over there and it shook the bridge near them. Mm-hmm. Could not find a pic of the old witch, but maybe th- this is like an artist rendition of what she might have just looked like. Also, super hot. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah so interesting. You, man, you were really into Vargas girls when you were <laughs> prepping this episode. You trying to give me some subtle hints or what? Hey. Hey. Okay. Hey, right. I, you, look great. you look great in that outfit. Ooh, Halloween. Here we go. Here we go. Here we come. Oh, man. That was, a, that was a lot. That was a lot. I didn't even, I wrote one note at the beginning. I just wrote the name of it because I was so deeply into it. Okay, good. That was fucking scary. Mm-hmm. And what an awful position to be in. For yeah. for Amy, where she like she didn't want to go, mm-hmm. she was so scared. She knew better. I mean, just safety alone. Forget about the witch. Mm-hmm. Just doing well. Yeah, just standing, standing on, on the an, edge with like a couple inches on the other on. side of the railing. Don't be a fucking idiot. That's a death wish. That's a death wish. Because even if uh, you're like sober, even if mm-hmm. it's the middle of the day, there's there's running water, uh, flowing water beneath you, which means there's condensation on the bridge, which oh, means it's yeah, always slippery. slippery. Because it's steel and water and like, come on. So dumb. Mm -hmm. So dumb. So that just like was so upsetting to me. And then she was forced into it. She didn't want to be there. And and then no one believed her. Mm -hmm. And that is infuriating. Yes. Yes. And Rob, Rob's a fucking (laughs) douchebag. Get a life. 21, hanging out with high school kids, like encouraging them to do stupid shit. Oh, Rob. There's always a Rob. There, there is around, always a Rob. Hanging yep. around in high school. I won't say the name of mine, but there was. there's always <laughs> oh, yeah. a Rob. We had, we had a Rob hanging around. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. He I, I won't say the name of mine either. He wasn't a bad guy. Nope. Mine, mine other was actually mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> I don't know if he ever got married, but I know he's got a kid. And uh, he, was, he was always a nice guy. He just was. Yeah. I think of Matthew McConaughey, uh, Daisy Confused. Oh, yeah. I keep getting older and they keep staying the same age. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Oh, my God. All uh, right, all right, all right. His whole life. His whole life. <laughs> that poor guy, he is. He either loves that phrase or hates it. Oh, I, I, yeah. Hopefully he embraces it where it's like it launched, helped launch his career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he would still mm-hmm. say it. When we when we worked with him, he was like still pretty into it. So. Oh, fun. oh, that's right. I forget you worked with him years yeah. ago. Yeah, good guy. You said really he was like good. real hippy dippy, but a good guy, right? Yeah, really good guy. Yeah, cool. Yeah, very sweet. Very sweet. Not big on <laughs> deodorant, I've heard. Uh, like he just, you know, well, natural he had, living. He had just come from surfing. Oh, so. okay. Uh, you know, cool. I couldn't. That's sweet. That's 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 so McConaughey. Like I love hearing that. Yeah, of course he just came from serving on set. Yeah, he. You know, in uh, along the PCH, uh, when you get into Malibu, there's that really lovely. It, I mean, it sounds silly, but trailer park, and it overlooks the ocean. Oh, I know exactly that. Yeah, yeah. that's when he was up there living in his airstream. And oh my we went, god, I love it. We went there for a fitting, and we were like, "Where is he?" And his assistant was like, "Oh, like he he just." He's surfing. He'll he'll be right back. He just came back from surfing, and fuck yeah, he, is. he came back from like the communal showers, like just a towel wrapped around his waist, barefoot. Oh my god! And just so sweet, just like the most down to earth. <laughs> it was right before he met his wife, and uh-huh. like he just, I think it was like maybe right around the bongo incident. No, it I don't remember the it was, like, bongo not incident. Not too long before or after that when like somebody came to his house it must have been after that because he wasn't living there or there was like reports of him like living in his house just like being really high playing the bongos sweet right am i making that up I, i've never heard that but it, uh, that sounds that sounds i'm, like I'm gonna get an email about this i know i will I, um but he just he was he was great and then you know we worked with him for several months and his mom came to set and she was the cutest sweetest thing like huh. he's just a decent guy that that's is awesome like Holy decent. I, uh, I've i never never met him. The only like secondhand encounter I had was years ago. I was doing this. No long, it's been gone for many years. It was Huntington, West Virginia, a little comedy club, like Pullman Square, kind of a really cute part of this downtown. Okay. And um, and there was some movie where he played a high school football coach. I never even saw it. I think there was oh. like a plane crash involved somehow. That's not radio, is it? We are Marshall. 
We is are that, Marshall. Is that, is that what That's it was? a movie. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, he was in town before I was there, not that long before mm-hmm. filming there, and he stayed at the same hotel. It was like the one kind of cool little hotel in town. Right. And I was asking like the front desk clerk about him, like how was he? And he was like great. And I guess he like got a lot of tension, and people kind of sure. like, because he would um he would go for a run every oh. morning, and he'd go for a run with his shirt off. Of course he would. Like through downtown, and I guess it was like you know people once they figured out he like, is a specimen. Uh huh. They figured out like what time he was running. Like all the local girls were like, oh, we gotta watch Ma- Ma- Matthew's running by. That is funny. <laughs> I love that. <sighs> That's great. That's yeah. great. Okay, so before I dive into my stories, should we talk about why I'm particularly on edge? Oh, yes. This is all your fault. For, it yes. is it's 100% my fault. And I just, before you... Wait, you said my 100% my fault. Yeah, I said it's 100% your fault. Oh, yeah, gotcha. And before you tell everyone what happened okay. or is happening, I just want to say mm-hmm. that previously we were worried about like me being scared and me keeping you up all night and you not getting any sleep. Right. And now my, 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 how the tables have turned. (laughs) Or as Kyla would say, how the turns have tabled. How the turns have tabled. I know I was going to say that and I'm like, but you guys don't know our family inside joke. Um, Um, So I got about two hours of sleep last night and I'm fucking cranky and I'm tired and not thrilled. I, it was just this so. Is, this is your fault. It was so random. We had a great time Saturday. Night. We we never have company. We're trying to like do that more. Like have more of like a like adult friends and have mm-hmm. them over more. Because we just Especially don't like me. people. <laughs> I like. I just it's, no, I'm we too don't. busy. We're just like we're very particular about yeah. who we spend our time with. And we're very protective of our space and our our sanctuary. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Well, I like uh, we had Jeff and Liz over, and mm-hmm. it was such a fun night. Oh my god! And then so our great. nephew Emerson. Hello, Emerson. I know he listens. Hi, um, he was so he was so great uh, as a guest. Had so much fun, and so it's Emerson and like Kyler and Ro were hanging around. It was just it was just fun. It was like it was really fun. Jeff is like uh, he's a mixologist. He he really is, and I mean he was whipping up. What did he oh, give me man. like? He was, making fancy drinks in the kitchen because he became obsessed with prohibition era yep. cocktails. So it he's, was like corpse something or I another. Know. I don't know. Everything was so good. I was he's so garnish, garnishing drunk. stuff and he's grinding slapping things the basil. And, a, and a mortar and pestle. He's doing all kinds of fun stuff. It was so cool. He had his own bar mat. Yep, he uh, brought his own custom bar mats. We got to get him a gift. Uh, so he comes. Oh, so he had blue gin. He had blue, blue gin. gin. It was so good. It was so cool. And, Sorry. Oh yeah, and then and then so you know it was fun night. I don't remember yeah. being spooked at all. That no, whole why night. Would you? No, not all. So I go to bed, and then it was just so random. I wake up at three o'clock in the morning. And three o'clock. I know, and that's what freaked me out too. I wake up at three o'clock in the morning because I looked at the phone, and I just immediately like I woke. I must have had a nightmare or something that I just don't remember because I uh-huh. woke up feeling Excuses. so much dread. And then, and then just like this powerful feeling of like, don't look at the mirror. Uh-huh. And I was freaking myself out and it sucked because I, I was so thirsty because we'd been drinking. Right. And I really wanted, I was like, you're going to have a headache in the morning. If yeah. You don't get some water now, which luckily I didn't. Thank God my body uh, likes drugs. But so I was like, you're going to have a headache in the morning. Um, you should go up and get some water. But I just could not bring myself to get out of bed. I can't believe like, you it, didn't I, wake me up. I didn't want to wake you up and then get you scared because I knew it'd get you well, scared too. Well, it's too late now. I know. It's but, not like you were not going to tell I me felt, you're the world's worst secret keeper. I know I am. And I felt and I felt like a like in my mind. I was like, if I, if I look oh, over I the mirror, there's going to be some darkness coming. No, I thought I thought there was something in the room with me, and I just didn't want to look at it. And uh-huh. it was it freaked me out so bad I couldn't fall asleep for a while. Like that's the most scared I've been in bed. And then I was mad at myself for being like a baby uh-huh. and being scared. And uh-huh. I just kept saying, like, just get up, just go get your water. And then I was like, I'm not getting my water. And so I just stayed there thirsty until I eventually fell back asleep. Uh-huh. That was like the most scared I've been in bed since I was probably like uh, a kid. Uh huh. I mean, if, if and it came out of nowhere. If well. Because that's how it is. And I love how you were like, oh, like maybe I was having a bad dream. No, what happened is real. Like, I know you don't want to give any validity to it, mm-hmm. but that is the thing is that it's like, it's so overwhelming with the feeling of dread. Yes. And that's a terrible, okay. So, okay. So today's Tuesday. So you told me this on, that was Saturday. So on Sunday you were like, oh, I had this, like this dream and yeah. I, or, or I thought I saw something in the mirror and I was like, what? And I'm like, what was it? You're like, I don't know. It was like dark. I'm mm-hmm. like, and I said, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about mm-hmm. it because I don't want that imagery in my head. And then yeah. yesterday, somehow it came up mm-hmm. or, you, or you brought it up. Like maybe you were flashing back You on didn't it. want to hear about it again, though. I brought it up last night, Monday night, and you didn't want to hear about it again. I know because I was like, I don't want to hear about it. Like you started yeah. to talk about it a little bit more. And yeah. at first I was like, okay, you should just tell me. I should just get it over with. I should know what you saw. And then you're like, well, I don't really know if I saw anything. It just like maybe like some darkness in the mirror. And I just tried to brush it off because I didn't want it to get into my subconscious. Mm-hmm. And we were working on stuff at, late at night, horror stories. And, and you were listening to fucking listening Trent to... Reznor, scary mo- music. Uh-huh. It, it was just, it was too much. It was too much. I'm taking a break from drinking 
drinking right now, so I couldn't even <sighs> dull my senses. It was just like all the things. I did not want to be high. The last thing mm-hmm. I needed was a weed gummy to mm-hmm. eke up the paranoia. So we get in bed, and like per usual, you got in, and five minutes later, you're fucking out, snoring loud. Awesome. Oh, for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing like the nudge, the quit snoring, the I hate you pushes, the like I can't fall yeah, asleep. I don't remember any of that. Of course you don't. And I have the blankets up over my head because now <laughs> I am so scared because who sleeps closest to the mirror? I do. And when I was prepping my stories, there was like somebody who talked about a mirror. I'm not, I'm not sharing that story today. They were talking about a mirror and like, you know, uh-huh. you know, I know you're not supposed to face the mirror because it's a portal. And I was like, oh my God, I can't face the mirror, but that's my favorite side to sleep on. And like, why do I have this mirror on the exterior wall of our house? Like having all these crazy thoughts. So I have the blankets up over my head, which is... I don't know how people sleep like that. I just immediately feel like I'm going to pass out. Uh, yeah, it's, I get too hot. I get too hot. So I like had this whole situation where I had like the blanket like up, but just like my nose out. I had this whole thing so that I could not see anything, mm-hmm. but I could still breathe. And then I was doing my mantras like you're surrounded by love and light. Like you choose, <laughs> you choose what you bring in. Like yeah. I'm like doing like all these like mental things. Like you're not welcome here. I'm telling it to leave because now I feel a terrible sense of dread uh. and I do not feel comfortable. I'm so freaked out. I can't sleep. This goes on for a solid hour and a half, two hours. Like I was like, I'd, I would reach over. I'd bring my phone under the bed, uh, under the covers and like check the time. I'm like, okay, okay. Then I finally calmed down a little bit. I tried to think about something else uh. And then I felt something touch my head. Uh, probably and Penny or Gigi. Not possible because okay. Gigi was under the covers in between, like between us, mm-hmm. between our legs. And Penny was up top facing you. Her paws were not facing me. So it's not like she mm-hmm. could have done one of her little wops. And I just, and, and then there was just no sleep. There was no sleep. I was Sucks. just in and out. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have a theory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you guys see what Jeff was mixing up? <laughs> did he have like, he's like, did okay, a little, bit of, a little bit of shrooms, a couple of oh tabs of acid, God. and we have a fun night. We were but, talking about shrooms. A <laughs> little bit of eye of newt, a uh, little bit of, uh, you know, salamander uh, tail. Like he's putting like witches God. shit in there. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I am very uncomfortable going to bed tonight. I think, Great. I think we need to cover the mirror. Actually, okay. All if right. Jeff asked you guys, "Hey, what you guys think of that?" Like, oh my God! What happened in your mirror? You didn't ah. tell him. Oh, that's we have to kill him. Uh, to, yep, we have to kill him. We love Jeff's him, but dead. he has to die. He yeah, has to die. sweet guy, great guy. We have to kill him. He's the nicest him. human we, ever. We have to kill him in front of the mirror. It's settled. Okay. Or we can just. I'm gonna get the salt out. Mm-hmm. I I guess I could put like salt around our bed. Uh, I'm gonna sage. Mm-hmm. Gonna open the windows. Sage it out. I know people don't like me talking about sage, but I'm going to sage. I have to. I need it. Um, and I'm going to get, I'm going to put the right crystals underneath our pillows tonight. Not mine. Dude, you don't know how many times there's been crystals under your pillows. Okay. I'm going to put the right crystals under our pillows tonight. I'm going to cover the mirror and pray. <laughs> Fucking pray. If I feel the dread again, I'm going to, I have a new mantra. I'm going to, I'm going to like, just take Gigi. <gasps> Take, Why? Take Gigi, not me. Take Gigi, not me. Take Why? Gigi, not me. Why? Because if it has to be me or the Gigi, then it's got to be Gigi. That's terrible. Why would you do that to our sweet puppy? <laughs> no, if you feel it again, mm-hmm. I think you should wake me up. No way. Yes way. It's. I would rather... And expe- you're going to feed off the fear. And then I, it's, no, I'm already n- there. What but, fucking difference does it make? What mm-hmm. difference does it make telling me afterwards or in the moment? It would be better for you to wake me up in the moment, calmly say like, okay. hey, I'm scared. And I feel like there's something here with me. I would, because then you could have verification. Or I could be like, oh, mm, God, you okay, think what you're I like, seeing? I like the verification oh, angle. Oh, it's just like the, we have like this like rack. Oh, man. What okay. I think is that, what I'm hoping is that you were just having a bad dream yeah. or whatever. And then we have that rack on our wall that holds blankets. Mm-hmm. And they do make like a weird. Mm-hmm, weird shadow. Yeah, because the shape is like, you know, yeah. the hook is like this and the blankets hang. So it kind of yeah. is a ghosty. Classic ghost shape. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. But fuck you, man. I'm so tired. Okay. I'm so mad. I told Dan earlier I came in. I was like, I'm fucking cranky. He's like, mm-hmm. why? I'm like, oh, because I didn't fucking sleep. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm mad at you. Okay. So there you have it. <laughs> Do you need some water? No, I'm good. Make Drink more water during the day, okay? Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Are you ready for three spoopy tails? Thumbs up. Okay. Two thumbs up. Mm-hmm. And you have your... I do. I have my uh, red squishy. Red devil squishy? You really can't smell it? Mm. Huh. Looks cool, though. I know it is cool. I can't, I forgot. I meant to grab the notes of the email from the girl. Those are from the Cleveland show. Oh, cool. And uh, oh god, she gave them really funny names because there was a Layla. There's that one, and then there's another one that looks like that. And she gave them funny names like Albert and I don't know. They were really funny. Okay, 
Uh, so, as we're like transitioning from summer into fall, I thought it would be super fun to close out the the summer on this story. Um, because I don't think we've heard a story yet like this of f- friends at a summer camp oh, cool. and a haunting. Yeah, and, I don't think so. No. And like, what a classic trope, too, of like the haunted summer camp. Mm-hmm. You know, True. like all these people. I can't believe no one's ever experienced that mm-hmm. or shared it up until this point so um i don't know i'm gonna say stick with it to the end because it wraps up really nicely at the end cool okay here we go what are you thinking about nothing okay you seem distracted i, th- I, was, I was imagining that you're thinking about the ghost still in our oh, house no, huh? okay all right hey dan and Lindsay. oh sorry she, the title of the story is something's spoopy at buena park inn hey dan and Lindsay. In the summer of 2015, I had just turned 18, and my very Catholic mother shipped me off to a religious camp for the next couple of weeks, as she did every year. That year, the camp was being housed at Buena Park Inn, right across the intersection from Knott's Berry Farm in Southern oh, yeah. California. Mm-hmm. A bit of setup. Buena Park Inn basically set up like a motel, all the doors of the rooms leading directly to the sidewalk outside. The camp had reserved an entire block of the rooms. My room was at the very end of the row, and I was sharing it with my friend Lauren and a couple other girls. Next door to me was my friend Veronica with her three roommates, and further down the hall was my friend Bella, and then near the end were my friends Elizabeth and Bianca, and Bianca was Bella's sister, and they were sharing a room with two others. Now, onto the spooky shit. The first day we were there, we were all given key cards. Mine worked just fine, but quite a few of my friends had issues with their key cards not working. A quick trip to the front desk, however, and we had new ones set up, and everything was fine for about a week. And then it happened. One night, Veronica's roommates were heading to bed, but she decided to stay up a little later to take a shower. Her bed was closest to the bathroom, so she figured it was no big deal. She showered quickly and hopped into bed quickly in the dark. She closed her eyes, waiting to fall asleep, when she was suddenly hit with an overwhelming feeling that she was going to die. She thought about waking up her roommates, but something told her not to wake them, not to move. And so instead, she silently started praying. After a moment, Veronica looked to the far end of the room towards the door and front window. Standing there, still as death, was a figure. She described it looking like a tall, thin person in a hoodie. It it was backlit by the light creeping in between the window shades, so she couldn't make out any features, but she said that it somehow looked wrong. Like its arms were too long or had too many joints or something. Veronica was frozen in fear, staring at the figure. And then it started to walk across the room towards her. It got halfway across the room and suddenly the figure vanished. Veronica stayed frozen in bed wondering what the hell she had just seen. She was startled by a sudden frantic knocking at the door. After what she had just seen, there was no way in hell she was getting out of bed, much less opening the door. So she closed her eyes, willing whatever it was outside to leave, and soon the knocking stopped. Veronica eventually fell into an uneasy sleep. The next morning, she told a bunch of us what she had seen. When she mentioned the feeling of impending death, Lauren looked scared. She told us she had had the exact same feeling and also started to pray because she felt like she couldn't wake anyone. Later, Bella told us also the exact same thing. After breakfast, we gathered in the meeting room for the start of our day when one of the camp leaders told us something wild. The night before, Bianca had had a seizure in her room. Elizabeth, thankfully, had first aid training and knew what to do, so Bianca made it through okay. But weirdly, she didn't have a history of seizures and hadn't had one since, so to this day we have no idea what caused that seizure. Afterwards, we were talking to Elizabeth about us about it, and she told us after she made sure Bianca was stable, she ran down the row of rooms, knocking on the doors, looking for help. It all clicked. The frantic knock Verona heard was Elizabeth looking for help, which meant that the exact moment that all three girls felt like they were going to die, and the moment Veronica saw that dark figure in her room was also the exact moment Bianca had had the seizure. Hmm. A few more odd things happened during camp, like Veronica suddenly feeling full-on suicidal one night despite no history of it, and our research leading us to discover that at least one suicide had happened in the motel before, but nothing as significant as what had happened that night. All the other girls who were affected ended up piling into my room for the rest of camp. I pulled an all-nighter the first night after the figure to keep an eye on them as well as slept on the floor in front of the door and hung a rosary on the door handle for the remainder of camp. 
I volunteered to be the one to guard them because I knew I wouldn't be affected by it. How did I know that? Because my key card was fine that first day. Every single girl who felt something strange throughout the two weeks were the same girls who had key card troubles the very first day. Thanks to you, thanks both for putting together such an amazing podcast that entertains peepers like myself. Shout out to my brother Thomas who introduced <laughs> me to the podcast. Love you, bud. Stay, <laughs> stay spooky, y'all. Junie. Junie. I know it's such a cute name. I know that is. That's interesting. That's an interesting detail about the um, the key cards. I know, isn't that weird? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, because there are like other um, you know stories that we've come across where I, I I think I think we have at least I've read about them on my own with like you know like. Uh, the paranormal somehow affecting like magnets. Oh yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah. You know, magnetic things. Right, right. Cell phones, uh, mm-hmm. you lose like electronics. Service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Radios go haywire. Right, I guess like tech in that way. Transmitters. Yeah, that's so weird. It's and just so of, odd. Yeah, and then of course the timing of the seizure with the timing of the sighting, nightmare, night terror, whatever you want to call it, being yeah. being exact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the like feeling of, of impending death, doom, mm-hmm. fear, seeing a figure in the room, and a seizure, and it yeah, all, all being connected to the people who had the key cards. Mm-hmm. It's it's as if they had like a mark Something. on their back, you know, like it right. was coming for them. And just just uh, and the yeah the timing of it, like like some presence was there at that time must have been yes. must have been also the knocking at the door even though she figured out what it was yeah. that would have fucking ruined me yeah don't you think mm-hmm what sorry happened? i just heard it, i think it was just a car driving by but it sounded it weird for a second. oh that's what it was yeah yeah weird yeah like, we don't get a lot of those around here i know but that's what it sounded like yeah <laughs> i know the sounds today i'm telling you i am on edge do you feel edgy now i now i do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. exactly all right well are you ready for the next one? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so we have a tried and true story. A uh, couple buys a house. They move in. Everything's okay until they start renovating. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. They start changing things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I was just I was just uh, going to my head too because that's something that uh, uh, tends to be for whatever reason a trigger in a lot of like poltergeist yeah. haunting stories. You know, specifically houses. Uh, yeah. When people change things, mm-hmm. like the entities there, are like. Mm-mm. They don't yeah. like it. No, they don't. They like mm-hmm. consistency. And I think the the deal there is that you're supposed to ask for permission first. Mm, okay. I mean, I never asked if we could paint the walls or lay down new floors. So <laughs> I honestly, oh, yeah, yeah. I started to think about that with what you saw. I was like, oh, shit. Did we piss something off? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, well, let's see how much one couple can possibly take. Hey, guys, I started listening to Scared to Death, and I found out about it through incredible feats. Oh, cool. And I absolutely love the show and thought I would share with you my story. That's the that's that's one person who jumped over. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Fair. The house I bought, I'm sorry, the house I bought in northern Minnesota in December of 2015 was definitely haunted. This was my first ever home purchase, and I bought the place myself. I was very excited to own my own place, and the price was pretty reasonable, seeing as the home was situated on about 30 acres of land. During the purchase process, I learned that the owner was selling it because it was his mother's house and she had passed away. Later, I joined the local volunteer fire department and learned that there had been calls at that house when she died in the home. This house was very meticulously kept in a particular way. There were many gardens around the large yard, and the home itself was very well kept, albeit old-fashioned. The seller even passed along several instructions on how to care for the place and even had a hand-drawn diagram of the plumbing for the pond and fountain in the backyard. It was a cute house, but not really my style aesthetically. Everything seemed fine until I started making changes to the home. I got married and my wife and I ripped up all the old carpet and put in laminate floors, painted every wall, changed the landscaping, got rid of most of the random gardens, cleared some woods to add to the yard, all of that sort of thing. I even got rid of the pond in the backyard because it just became too much upkeep. And that's when the phone started ringing, which doesn't seem strange, except that it was a landline phone that had no service. Mm. We didn't have a landline, and I checked with the cable company. There was no service to the house. In fact, when I moved in, I had to wait for the local internet company to run a new line underground to the house before I even had internet. The phone was an old see-through phone, like from the 80s or 90s, and it was out in the three-season porch. We ignored it at first, but it kept ringing every once in a while. One time I answered it, and a robotic-like voice asked for my wife in her maiden name. I hung up. Here's the thing. My wife never lived in that house under her maiden name. 
We didn't move in together until after we were married. One day, while my wife was home alone, the phone started ringing again, and she ignored it. She told me it rang for a long time, and then when she finally gave in and went over to answer it, it stopped ringing before she could even get near it. And then the wall mirror in our bedroom shattered into hundreds of pieces. Wow. It might be more accurate to say the mirror exploded. She ran outside and called me from work, called me at work from the front yard, too scared to go inside. When I got home, she was still in the yard, shaking. I didn't believe her at first, but when I went inside and over to our room, it was unmistakable. The frame of the mirror was still on the wall, but every inch of the bedroom was covered in glass. At this point, I had had enough. I cleaned up the glass, then took the phone off the wall and went outside and threw it in the dumpster. And as I walked back into the house, I heard the phone start ringing. I wish I could say that it ended there. For the next few years, things started going wrong in every way. We had water damage in our bedroom, and we had to move into the guest room while I fix it. Then our house was completely overtaken by mice. I mean, Uh. dozens of them in every dark space. Anytime we went away for a weekend, we would come home to find that mice had had their way with the place, getting into every drawer and making a huge mess. They even chewed up our old couch so badly we had to throw it out. One night, we even woke up to one crawling around inside our comforter as we slept. (laughs) The power started cutting out even when the weather was good, once for so long that we had to throw out all of our food. Eventually, we just gave up and put the place on the market. I quit my job in the area so that we could move far away from that place. So far, our new home has been great. We're starting to do some renovations. But before we started, I made sure to disconnect the phone line and throw out all the phones, just in case. Man, that the robotic voice combined with the... Maiden name combined with the phone not being active. The phone not being fucking connected. <laughs> God. Why was it still ringing after he threw it away? Why? Ah, uh, that's freaky. Why? And then the and I normally don't care about mice. Oh God. Like 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 a one random mouse doesn't freak me out like some people. Sure. But an infestation of mice where you're seeing dozens of mice, it's just so fucking dirty. Oh, it's so gross. Like they shit everywhere. Oh, and I get the feeling that they were meticulous homeowners. Mm-hmm. That they, and so I'm sure that they set traps and had an exterminator and did all the things. Yeah. But they would just keep coming back. Oh, ah. Yeah, that phone detail. Oh. Well, I, and uh, why did why did the mirror burst? That's a weird mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. If we went home right now and the mirror that is hanging on the wall that is giving us pause for concern. No, thanks. Yeah, that thing exploded with no one touching it. Okay, then what do we do? Where are we sleeping tonight? Oh, man. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Pick a hotel. Because <laughs> I'm not staying. Yeah. No fucking way. I'm going to have to talk to the spirit at the house. We got to get it out. <laughs> it's time for it to get the fuck out. We're not leaving. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I feel like we just got our house situated how we love it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go. No, we're not going to go. We're not going to go. Um, I also would like to say that this last story freaked me out so much and had me looking over my shoulder so much last night that it may have fed into my own fears. Okay. So maybe it was just a bad combination of everything all at once. What do you think? I think so. Possible? Uh, I, I also wanted to acknowledge, uh, we haven't made fun of Darren's in a while, yeah. but it is pretty funny where it's like, yeah, we just got the house situated like we want. We're not going to go. And it's like, yeah, that's the logic people have I when know. things, you know, start. You're like, why, why wouldn't they just leave? Okay. It's like, because there's a lot of emotion, emotional investment in your home. Okay. And, and mm-hmm. it was just maybe like one bad dream. Yeah, 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 yeah. This actually yeah. happened. But even if even if a fair amount of things were happening, I do understand me personally the rationale of like, yeah, there's financial considerations, and even when the finance is not a, a, a obstacle, right. even when you can't afford to move somewhere else, it's your fucking house, it's your I home, know. it's where you have your memories, it's where your family is. Yeah. I know, I know, it's true, it's true. But mm-hmm. I could still leave. I'm I'm happy to go. I'm more stubborn, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not. I think that the thing that about this particular story is that there was visual confirmation and interaction between a hardcore skeptic and mm. something not of this world. And so I just really like it sent me over the edge. Okay. And yeah, I, I think it's going to get you pretty good. Hey, Dan and Lindsay, I've been a fan of Dan's. Ugh, just kidding. I've been a fan of Dan since his guest appearance on Today in True Crime podcast from oh. a long time ago. Yeah, cool. Growing up, my family and I experienced small encounters in our house, but only on one side of the house, the side that was the closest to the house in question today. The house next door to ours had a long history of people moving in and then moving out six months or less 
later. When our neighbors would move out, it was seemingly out of nowhere. After seeing this happen on multiple occasions, my sister and I started making jokes about how the house next door was probably haunted. After making these jokes for a good while, we grew bored and decided to check things out for ourselves. At this time, the house was vacant of renters. We peeked through the windows and saw that the house was completely empty except for some small items left behind by previous tenants. As we continued around the house, we struck gold when we found a side door unlocked. The door led us into the garage, and as soon as we opened the door, I felt a complete sense of dread instantly come over me. I know I should have ran in the other direction, but I couldn't be a baby in front of my sister who would have no doubt mocked me relentlessly. Once we entered the garage, we put a giant rock in front of the door, propping it open to give us some light. I tried to open the door to the house, but it felt like something was pushed up against the door from the inside of the house. Mm. We were pushing against the door when we heard a loud bang against the garage door as if someone had hit it. We whipped our heads around quickly to find something or someone moving across the floor. Distracted by the figure we had just seen move across the garage, we were scared shitless when the door we had propped open suddenly slammed shut, trapping us in the garage with our new friend. A low growl started coming from the corner of the garage. We made a run for it, going towards the door that had just slammed shut, and the door wasn't budging. We continued to push and push and push, trying to escape as the growling started to grow louder and closer to us. Finally, the door <laughs> pops open and we ran. We ran past our house to the corner of the street, and we stopped only to catch our breath, but to our horror, about 40 feet ahead of us, across the street, stood a shadowy figure. I couldn't see a face, but I could feel that it was angry in every way. We turned around to run home, and when we did, there was another shadowy figure standing in front of the house we had just run from, the house next door to ours. We took off running as fast as we could, and when we reached our house, we began to cry as we told our mom what had happened. As we were relaying the story to her, I noticed something in our backyard. Perched on our rock wall was the shadowy figure, just staring at us. And from that day on, we steered clear of that house. With age, we tried to play everything off as blaming it on our overactive imaginations. That is, until our older sister moved into that house. Mm. Almost immediately, she began to report her encounters. Doors opening on their own, walking through cold spots, hearing low growls coming from her daughter's playroom, which was right next to the garage, and so on. My wife and I moved back in with my parents as we were saving up for a house and my wife was pregnant with our daughter. We were using one of the rooms that had an exterior wall facing the haunted house. The, ter the terror began again. I worked the late shift, leaving my wife home without me. She texted me one night, asking if I was okay as she had seen me walk into the restroom but had not yet seen me come out. I let her know that I was barely just leaving work and that, it w and that I was on my way home. Her, being a full-on peeper, I told her... Oh, it was probably my brother, who I knew was working late and not home, just to ease her mind so she could get back to sleep. When I got home that night, I went straight to bed, exhausted. I woke up later to get some water from the kitchen. I didn't bother to turn on the lights because it was going to be a quick trip. As I stood in the kitchen drinking my water, I looked down the dark hallway and saw my brother exit his room and pause to look at me. I asked him if he wanted some water, but he just shook his head no and proceeded to walk into the restroom. I put the cup in the sink and began walking to my room, crossing the front door. And at that very moment, my brother walked in, just getting home from work. Me, realizing what had just happened, stopped in my tracks. He asked me, are you okay? You look a little freaked out. I simply replied, nah, I'm fine, just tired. I'm going to go back to sleep. <laughs> Knowing damn well I wasn't falling back asleep that night. We still encounter things every so often when visiting my parents' house, but we play the, if I don't acknowledge it, it's not their game. Thanks again for reading my story, enjoying the podcast every week with my now creeper daughter, Guillermo. Guillermo, oh man. Woo! Right? Uh, th those mimic things, I, I hate it, doppelganger I stuff. Whew, I know, I know, I know, I know. I got the chills because uh, then I put myself in that situation. Yes. And I imagine when I, if I, what if I would have got water? Oh the my night, God. And oh my God. And I'm freaked out and, I, and, I'm, and I'm already spooked. And then I see some evil version of me like walk back down the stairs when I'm in the kitchen or something. Well, he didn't, God. he didn't necessarily see himself. I know he saw his brother. He saw his brother, but still. Or, or just a shadowy figure. There's no telling what it was. He just he made the assumption. Brother. Right, gotcha. Right, and then and then his wife made the assumption that that was him. Yeah, 
Uh, I, in my mind, I, I made it that this entity can like mimic, which is so creepy. Well, the fact that it it like mm. what did what did you do? We offered it water, and it's, it, like, it shook its Should've head. Said no. That's what I don't yeah, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't like the interaction. Mm-hmm. It responded to him. God dang. But I don't disagree. I do not disagree. Don't acknowledge it. It will go away. Because my witchy friends do tell me that like the moment you interact with it, you have now invited it in. Ugh. So that was part of why I was like, you laughing at me, but I was doing my mantras last night in my head. Like you are supposed to envision yeah. yourself surrounded in a white light and you control what comes in or doesn't come in. You have the power to choose whether you acknowledge right. it and let it in or not. So if it doesn't feel good you have to tell it to go it's not welcome here i don't believe in you you're not real i'm yeah. safe i'm protected i'm in the white light like you that's the only thing that gets me through it and take, i i think it does help take gg not me take Stop take it. take hot dog anderson oh my Stop god <laughs> anybody anybody who's been to a stand-up show of dan's lately you know who hot dog anderson just is. just a crazy reference but then Lindsay bought a crazy it's the funniest costume i've ever seen for a dog it's the best she, she brought a, bought a crazy hot dog costume that had the, the it's like the mustard uh on the hot dog the little mustard streak lights up <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and she's been having like ginger uh, wear it, and she's so tolerant. She'll she doesn't just, care. She, she took a nap she, in it. Mm-hmm, took a nap in it. Ate dinner with her hot dog suit. Oh, no, oh Penny ate dinner with the hot dog. Oh, suit. Penny, that's right. Penny was Penny forced to wear it. Too. And if you put something on Penny, she starts to do like a weird, like stiff arm sideways walk. She <laughs> loathes it. So funny to me. But she loves her food enough that she ate with the hot dog suit on. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, before, do you want to do our Annabelle shoutouts before we mention our other special announcement? Yes, 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 yes. Who first, you or me? Uh, I'll go first. Okay. Me, you, me. Gotcha. Okay, I would like to thank the following Annabelles. And, oh, yeah, Anna, oh, say Ann Roberts. Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> the following Annabelles uh, for supporting the show. Amber Johnson, Spike Chandler, Erica Hale, Nathan Truckenbrod, Kenneth Green, <laughs> Stu Pedasso, Katie Dillon, Oh, man. I think this was supposed to be Jacob Hammond. I wrote Jacon. When I was typing, sometimes I miss words or letters. Brianna Stevenson, Melissa Johnson, Azaria Holmes, Liz McFeeters, Brooklyn West, Nika, no last name, Robert D. Rowland, Stephanie Rivera, Gabby Gordon, Ellie Tucker, Alex Lebo, Isaac Rivera, Kiki Wilness, Ryan Schaefer, Evelina Malmston and Nathan Mantlo. Brooklyn West sounds like a golden era of Hollywood, like old timey actress. It's so funny. Starring they, Brooklyn West I honed, and Fred Dillinger. I I honed in on that name as well when I was typing <laughs> this up. I was like, man, I thought like, is that the name of a brewery? Is that the name of a magazine? Like, it felt so familiar. Golden and, Metro's Pictures presents the Admiral starring Brooklyn West. Something like that. I don't know. Do you have more? No. The Riveras were killing me. My my <laughs> high school sweetheart, my first like serious boy, boyfriend, his last name was Rivera. And I was like, oh, oh so sweet. <laughs> uh, oh, boy, Rivera. Oh, uh, he's a good guy. Uh, okay, so I would, I would like to thank the following Annabelle's. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Lindsay Duck's boyfriend. Uh, and Andrew Rivera. And uh, also Courtney Munger, Jen McKee, Ian Allen, Cassandra Loney, Monroe Ferguson. Ferg, uh, Monroe Ferguson? Oh, my God. Yeah, Monroe, uh, the Ferguson is just spelled different than Monroe Ferguson, Maggie Cortez Quintero, Ashley M. Michael Shaw, uh, Eric Boglin, Josh Webster, Jonathan Sun, uh, Isaiah Knight, Brianna Summers, Advanced Zuck, funny, <laughs> uh, Chuck Hall, Bryce Resner, uh, Kalista Morgan, Carson Blodgett. <laughs> this is a funny one. This is what they wrote. Yeah. I am fully erect. <laughs> <laughs> Another funny one, Lindsay Ralston or Heather. That's a little joke with one of our fans. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Jessica Macklin, Brett McElwain, Annabelle Lewis, Savannah Lewick, Patrick Berry. So thank you. It was a mouthful of names this week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I decided to take some on my side instead of giving you all the difficult all the ones. ones. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, and now you have spoopy shout outs. I do. I do. To Dana from Claire. Happy birthday. To Ariel from Baby Cakes. I'm sorry. It's probably... Ariel? No, Ariel. To Ariel from Baby Cakes, love you. To Ashley from Andy, you're my favorite person. We say that. Yeah. That's cute. To Tina from your son Daniel, get well soon. Uh, Tina had surgery. Okay. To Dusty from Travis, he says, how are you now? 
some inside joke. And to Louie from Michelle, happy birthday. Oh, that's great. That is great. And that is our show, but Lindsay would like to briefly tease out something we're doing in 2022. Get it on your radar. Okay, get it on your radar. The Gathering. The Gathering. So if you have come over from Time Suck, you know that in previous years, in 2018 and 19, we had The Gathering. Mm -hmm. Um, And, well, actually, no, 19 and 20. 19 was in person. No, 18 was in person, 19 was in person, mm-hmm. 20 was virtual. Exactly. Bless. I cannot keep things straight with That's that weird year we had. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously we couldn't do it last year, COVID, and we can't do it this year, COVID. We will mm-hmm. be doing like a virtual something. Stay tuned for that. But more importantly, because it's been such a shit show, we decided that 2022, we're going balls yeah, to the wall. we're going big. We're going big. So we're going to have a little like Coachella-esque uh, Bad Magic Festival mm-hmm. here in Coeur d'Alene. So we're telling you guys now because we don't have the details hammered out. Mm-hmm. We know it's going to be August of next summer. Um, we have a few dates on the books. We've reserved uh, at this really cool uh, Boy Scout camp. I mean, we're talking like... We're going to turn into a Bad Magic camp. Mm-hmm. So we're talking like, it's going to be grown-up mm-hmm. camp. Mm-hmm. It's going to be grown so up sleepaway cool. camp. It is going to be great. We're working with an event planner here locally who's also a good friend of ours and super, super talented. Actually, last year she won this amazing award mm-hmm. for... Sarah. Yeah, Sarah. Sarah Day. Um, her, she did this awesome... Um, Wedding, were they vampires? Like, oh, they, yeah, uh, vampires. Yeah, like mm-hmm. won this amazing war for this like really spooky but very classy wedding that she is. She's so cool. So she gets our brand. She understands. Mm-hmm. And it will be limited tickets. And so we're just letting people know now because it's like, listen, if you live in New York, you are going to have airfare. You're going to mm-hmm. have a ticket into the event. Like you're going to yeah. have costs. So we don't know what it's all going to look like. But we just wanted to start sharing that now as mm-hmm. we're going into holiday and then Tax refunds, save your money. You know what I mean? But um, it's going to be really, really cool. We're excited. Very excited. So more announcements coming down the road. Yeah, we'll keep you guys posted. But as a little we, teaser. Yeah, as we know more details, we'll let you know. Uh, thanks for continuing to send your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death Man, today's got me. Uh, you can email us for everything else at info at scared to death podcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith, our, our art warlock on social media, uh, doing the bad magic merch.com design. Uh, store at badmagicproductions.com for customer service. Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And thanks to Sophie Evans for the finding the first story. And thanks to Olivia Lee for finding the second. Uh, if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes and more, please check out our Patreon. Be part of our TLA watch parties, all kinds of fun stuff. And enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Add Magic Productions. 